Morning, everybody. Morning. Uh, nice to see such a, a large group of people. And some of you are even sunny today. You look as if it's uh, almost sunshine out there, uh, which is really nice. And uh, yeah, pleasure to catch up with you all this morning. Um, so let's uh, begin by worship. Let's sing a song. Let's sing a hymn. Um, God of glory, we exalt your name. Uh, there's a bit where the ladies can have a, a bit of a blast in the chorus, I believe. So those who know uh, the ladies' part in the chorus, if you wouldn't mind, because uh, we are you outnumber us, so if you would do that. So let's stand to sing. God of glory, we exalt your name. Just one or two of the men trying to do the women's part, but <coughs> good luck to you. Let's pray, to, let's pray together as we come and continue our worship. That's the reason we're here, Heavenly Father, to come and to worship you and to glorify you and to exalt your name in this place. We thank you that we're able to do that this morning. We thank you for the day that you have given to us, the sunshine and the flowers, giving us a sense of your creation and your welcome in this world. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that as we're gathered here today, we can worship you in peace and quiet. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, for those around the world who can't do this in their own countries. We pray for those who are persecuted around the world and ask, Heavenly Father, that as they seek to worship you in secret in some times, in some places, that you will be there among them and that we might join with them in our worship and be one in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Our first reading comes from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. So if you've got your mobile phone, just uh, turn your devices on, and uh, we're looking at Acts chapter 1, verses 6. Also feel free to uh, open your Bible as well. I just want to check something. So I suspect that the battery's gone, mm -hmm. so, because I know about these things. <laughs> We already had a spare one prepared. Very good. Just like the pigeon. 
<laughs> so last Friday morning, I was in a meeting, and I mentioned and talked about Thy Kingdom Come. So Thy Kingdom Come runs from Ascension Day all the way through to Pentecost Sunday. And somebody in the meeting said, what's Ascension Day? So uh, I suggested that they went away and they got somebody to write an article about it and that was published on Thursday. I kind of explain it to unpack what is Ascension Day. It's all based on these words from Acts of the Apostles, starting from verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, this is Jesus speaking, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're not quite the ends of the earth, but I think Bignoff is included in that list. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill they call the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. Do you want it up to there or do you want a bit more? It's the way you just kind of, it's the way you kind of flinched. At, I'm thinking he expected me to stop. When they arrived, they were upstairs to the room where they were staying. There was present. There was Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all joined together, constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. That must have been quite a special prayer meeting, wasn't it? Yeah. All yours, Ray. Thank you, Ian. Uh, we'll have a, a little look at that, and also the next uh, reading, which we'll do shortly. Uh, so we're going to sing uh, again. Uh, this is uh, Blessed Be Your Name.
choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away, oh, you give and take away, but my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. do uh, a section of prayers of intercession and I'll leave a, a space um, where I'll encourage you if you want to pray out loud you can um, otherwise just pray quietly um, for your own situation and for the church I don't know what's going on here sounds like there's lots going on here <laughs> uh, so let's uh, pray please loving heavenly father as we come with prayers of intercession uh, to concern ourselves with the world at large and uh, this country especially. Uh, we do pray, Heavenly Father, for the ongoing uh, difficulties that are going on uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we thank you for the work that President Le I forgot his name. Lezensky? Zelensky. Yeah? Zelensky. Zelensky. Thank you. Um, the work that he's been doing and going around uh, to the various countries and talking to people to try and get assistance. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we in this country have stepped up uh, to give him as much as we can. But we do pray, Heavenly Father, for the ongoing uh, conflict that's been caused by President Putin. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, again, that you would intervene if it's at all possible, that you will turn the hearts of the people of Russia so that they can have uh, peace in their own land and also that the people of Ukraine can have peace as well. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and also those who have been displaced. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you give a special blessing to those people who have opened their homes around Europe and in this country as well, uh, to give succor and uh, a place of safety for those people who have been displaced and who feel terrified at the prospects of their own country at the moment. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they will one day be able to return to a peaceful nation. We pray also for the ongoing conflicts in Africa and we just ask Heavenly Father there again uh, that you'll be able to bring uh, a measure of peace uh, to the peoples there. And we pray for those parts of the world where there have been natural disasters and for the ongoing work of recovery, particularly in Syria and in Turkey. And we pray Heavenly Father for our own nation as we've uh, just recently celebrated the coronation of King Charles and we ask Heavenly Father that he will be a man who will stand by his promises mm -hmm. that he made uh, in that place. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the government who uh, oversee all the work of this nation will also step in line uh, with the Prince of Wales and now King Charles II, Charles III, sorry, uh, that uh, they too will be able to pursue uh, policies which will be beneficial uh, to this nation. We ask for our local governments as well, those who have been re-elected and those who have been disappointed. We just ask Heavenly <coughs> Father that they <coughs> will also step up and look to the nations as a whole and also to the individual parts that they are responsible for, that they too will be able to uh, deal with us in a good way and give those things that are needed, especially to those who are at the lower end of poverty scale and those people who are finding life extremely difficult in this time. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the church here and for all the churches that belong to you, that they might continue the work that they've been given and that they will continue to encourage the nation 
to serve you, to find you wherever they can, and to believe in you and to live lives according to your purposes. We pray, Heavenly Father, for all the things that go on in this church, and we ask that you continue to bless them in their well-doing. And now a moment of quiet where we can bring our own personal prayers to the Lord Jesus Christ. As we bring all our prayers to you, Heavenly Father, we pray that you will hear us and let our cry come to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen. Amen.
Our second reading is taken from uh, John chapter 17, verse 19 verses, and uh, Jesus here is praying both for himself and his disciples. John 17. After Jesus said this, he looked onwards towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth, and by completing the worth you give me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those who you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for, those, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am your power and to your, of your name, the name you gave me, so that they might be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and gave them safe and kept them safe by that name you gave me. No one has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you may protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. Sometimes as we get a bit older, and not that I'm claiming that at all, uh, there, there are phrases that, that come to mind. Um, one is, don't wear a checky t-shirt and a stripy tie. <laughs> And I, I remember somebody saying that to me not a few weeks ago. It was said again this morning. But here I am, checky shirt and stripy tie. <laughs> I think the sartorial. The sartorial, thank you, yes. Elegant, whatever you like. There's also another, <clears throat> another phrase that comes to mind. Um, and it, it, Usually men and, men and women who get married, they... They have this sort of uh, way. Uh, what's yours is mine and what's mine's my own. Well, this passage in chapter 17 of John's Gospel is a bit of that. There is a little bit in it which seems to say that what Jesus has is the same as what God has and what God has is the same as what Jesus has. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And this sort of works quite well. Um, but Jesus speaks here, this is seemingly um, a sort of table talk after their sharing of communion, which is why we put communion before uh, my talk today. Uh, it seems to fit. Uh, the other the Gospels don't particularly go at great length of having this great discussion after they the shared their meal on the Thursday, but it seems right that they should um, have a conversation at least that it's not just uh, go and prepare a place for me, go into the town, do all of that, find the place, go to the room, wait there for me, 
I'm coming along and Jesus arrives and they have a meal together and then they all go. And then he gets betrayed on the Mount of Olives. And that seems to me a bit short. There seems to be that there's something else to be had here. Um, And John's gospel seems to be the one that's holding the, the whole thing together and saying, yes, there is far more to this than just sharing bread and wine. There is more to this than just having fellowship together. Um, and of course, there's the context of the, the prayer that Jesus uh, prays or the words that he says afterwards are all a part of his legacy. He tells them about what's happened and what's going to happen. And he tells them a little bit about this and that and the other. And he talks to God and says, you know, God, this is, these are my children. These are my people. These are your people and all the people that you have given to me. And Jesus prays for himself. And because some people have thought that that's wrong. That is wrong to do that. You can't pray for yourself. Um, well, Jesus seems to have done it. So why not? And there are times when we go through life when things get really, really bad. And there is nothing to do but pray for yourself. God, help me. Please, get me out of this mess. Whatever it is we're going through in our daily lives. Not because we don't want to share it with somebody else, but because there is this personal connection that Christian people have with their God and through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is there for us as individuals. And so when you're going through the difficult times of life, um, it's not surprising that we're going to take ourselves off into a, a, not a closet, but a quiet place, whether it's the summer house or whether it's the kitchen while you're doing the dishes or whether it's a little quiet room, a little nook somewhere, or whether it's a drive into the countryside or somewhere where you can be alone with Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, with God. It's all well and good sharing a meal together, but there is this personal connection we have to have, which is only right. Because our lives, Jesus is suggesting in this passage in John chapter 17 and in a few other places, that our lives should be centred on God's like his is centred on God. To glorify God. And if we're not doing that because there is trouble at mill, then we need to get that sorted out because we can't be effective. There are things that we go through which will stop us being effective as Christian people because we don't want to lend a hand to the person who needs a hand. We don't feel like being nice people. We get really annoyed at various things. And we need to rebalance and reconnect so that we are glorifying God in what we do. Hebrews chapter 5 suggests in there, verses 7 to 10, that glorifying God, by Jesus glorifying God the Father, the Son is also glorified. And by analogy, we could take it that if we glorify God, then also the Son is glorified and also the Father is glorified. There seems to be a connection there, far stronger than most people would say. So he prays for himself. He knows where he's going. He knows the trouble that's going to happen over the next few days. And that he's going to be crucified for the world. Then Jesus prays for his disciples. Of course, these are the people who have been closest to him for that period of three years and more. And they are going to be the ones he's going to look to to carry on the work. And again, by analogy, if the disciples are going to carry on the work in the immediate term, then it stands to reason that those who they carry on the work with will continue the work and it will perpetuate itself down to us today. So we are continuing the work of God through Jesus Christ in our own day because there is an unbroken line from Jesus to us if we believe in him. And Jesus only asks three things uh, for his disciples. 
to direct his prayer to God, he actually raises his arms. He looks up to heaven at this point in the proceedings. Uh, you can imagine them. You, you know when the, the picture, um, somebody painted a picture on a wall somewhere in Italy, I think it was, um, of this scene. And you, you can picture them there, and then they're having this conversation after they've had their meal. And you can imagine Jesus just looking up to heaven and all the disciples going, what, 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 what's going on here? And he's saying to God, talking to God the Father. And all he asks God for, basically for his disciples, is the first thing is protection. Protection. Because he wasn't protected very well. There were things that happened to Jesus which should never have happened. And he wasn't protected very well by his people around him. He wasn't even protected by those who you would expect him to be protected by. The Jewish rulers, the Jewish people who were in charge of the, of the temple, who were supposed to protect all Jewish people. They didn't protect him. They didn't even acknowledge, you know, that Jesus was the Messiah. They'd been looking for the Messiah for, for years. Years and years and years they'd been looking for the Messiah and they knew they knew that the Messiah was going to come from the city of David. And yet they kept saying about this Jesus fellow, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. He can't be the Messiah because he comes from Nazareth. Excuse me. I don't come from South Shields, do I? <clears throat> no. I have, I have come from South Shields today, but I don't come from... Kathleen does. She comes from South Shields because that's where she was born. But I don't come from South Shields because I only live there. I actually come from Hanover in Germany. I am of the Hanoverians. <laughs> <clears throat> there is royal blood here. <clears throat> And so too Jesus. Jesus didn't come from Nazareth. He just happened to live there for a little bit of time and had a word woodwork shop or something. He came from Bethlehem. And yet all these highfalutin people who were spouting off about the grace of God and all the rest of it and how wonderful God is couldn't even recognize that the Messiah was right in front of them. Because he came from Bethlehem, this Jesus of ours. So he needed protection for his disciples. That's what he's praying for. The other thing that he prayed for his disciples was joy. Sheer joy. Just the, the word is, is a lot flowery in the original. But it really feels like this ecstatic joy. You know, when, you, when you've been and you've done something and you've pulled up your first carrot or something like that of the season, you know, you get the joy that you get from it. Or you've got in the car and you've driven um, from here to London and you didn't even know that you'd been on the motorway. And the joy of arriving, that sort of a joy. You know what I mean, euphoric stuff. That's what he wants for his disciples. Jesus had that joy, it seems. He didn't demonstrate it particularly. But he seems to have had a good, joyful life. He also wants them to be sanctified. To live godly lives. To have lives which are in tune with God through the Holy Spirit. Because he knows these men that were at the table with him. And there would have been some women there as well. But that these men particularly, and the women as well, I'm going to include them because I think they actually did a lot of good work as well. Even if it's not acknowledged. <laughs> because where would we be without you? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> I can tell by your faces. We'll deal with you next. Okay. But there is something for them to do which is going to take time and it's going to be long lasting and they need to be felt as if they're protected they need to feel the joy of what they're doing and they need to feel that they're in tune with God because the work that they're doing is going to be blooming hard it's going to be really hard they're going to go to places where nobody else wants to go 
They're going to travel all over the place. And after the resurrection of Jesus, and uh, when Jesus was buried, of course, there was, uh, there was a couple of blokes who did that. Um, who did that? Joseph of Arimathea. Bear with me, because this is only a legend. But Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus put Jesus in the tomb. And the next time we hear of Joseph of Arimathea, he's in the south of England. He's got one of Thomas Cook's travel things. <laughs> he, he found a little leaflet and he said, go to England. You know, and he came. It's only a legend, but there seems to be something in it because there were records of the disciples going to the south of Spain. There were records of the disciples going to the south of India. There were records of the disciples going all over the place. So why not England? Why should we be excluded? And Glastonbury is the place that they arrived at. And the legend goes that Joseph with his uh, staff stuck his staff in the ground and a tree grew. It sounds weird, doesn't it? But there was a tree there until the vandals got hold of it. But the people kept a little piece of the tree and put it in the churchyard in Glastonbury. And it's still there today. Now, is that a connection? Is that something to demonstrate that these people who were given a task by Jesus to go and spread the gospel actually came as far as England? Well, I think they did. Because they got to Germany. Why not England? The ferries were running. The trains were on time. There was no shortage of buses. And then Jesus goes and prays for all believers. He sort of spreads it out to everybody. He's going this stage further, not just to pray for the people that are around him and in a hypothetical way preach, uh, teaching and saying about the people that you are going to go to, but he prays for them in particular because the message of salvation is not an easy message to proclaim. It's not an easy message to take around the world, particularly if you have to learn another language to do it. And these people were going to bring the gospel to many, many thousands of people in their day. An understanding and a knowledge of God. And Jesus prays particularly for those, and that includes us today. Unity, that's the key word for us unity in the gospel so that we can see and attain the glory that Jesus had with his father that we can share in it and that above all God's love is demonstrated and you know something down through the years and down through the ages as I've been reading a bit of British history we failed that one quite dramatically at some stages not to demonstrate God's love even between Christians. But that's what Jesus wants us to do. Because the underlying principles are based on obedience to God's will. All over the place where Jesus talks and where the disciples are talking, it's about obedience to God. Earlier I mentioned uh, something about uh, what happened in Hebrews about uh, Jesus and God having this connection. And the disciples at this point are sitting around a table still. And they have the privilege of the presence of Christ. We are not as fortunate as them. And down through the ages there seems to be a feeling sometimes in the Christian soul that God is not as close as he says he is. That there's something amiss with what the scriptures tell us. That God actually doesn't particularly care. There was a song written by um, Julie Gold, <clears throat> 1985. Now then, this will get some of you thinking. It was sung by Bette Midler. From a Distance. It's not a religious song, it's a pop song. 
But from a distance, the world looks blue and green and the snow-capped mountains white. From a distance, the oceans meet the stream and the eagle take their flight. From a distance, there is harmony. And it echoes through the land. It's the voice of hope. It's the voice of peace. It's the voice of every man. And this song talks about hope, peace, hope again, love, hope again, peace again, and God watching us from a distance. And there's this perception that because the disciples had the privilege of Jesus, we don't get that privilege. As we live our Christian lives, and as I talk to people, they, they just don't feel God close to them anymore. There seems to be a disconnect. And sometimes it is true that we feel God is at a distance from us. <coughs> that he isn't as close to us as he could be. And yet Jesus said that he would be going to the Father and he would leave us another comforter, the Holy Spirit. So why does God seem distant? In Exodus chapter 20, when the people, it reads this, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. And said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But don't have God speak to us, or we will die. And there's a human perception of, there is a disconnect between us and God. Because he is such a fearful God. He's a God not to be messed with. We have to be so careful of what we say and do because God's anger and wrath will come upon us like nobody's. Been. Now that was used to be the preacher of the old days. And there is a truth in it that God will be unhappy with some of the things that we've done and said. But people were frightened of him. But that doesn't seem to be the case today. But God seems distant to people. There are other times that God might seem distant to people because of what we are doing, how we are living, the things we are saying and the things we are preparing to do. This can happen in a church. This can happen in a community of believers when we don't continue to keep God at the centre, to keep Jesus there, when we stray away and start doing our own thing. Singing our own songs. Not worshipping God at all. But worshipping ourselves. Or worshipping the singer. Worshipping the skiffle group. Whatever it might be. And God will not be close by you. If you have something that's called unrepented sin. It's quite obvious that he cannot bear it. There are things that we do which he will not be happy with. Even those people who are seemingly religious. Jesus says, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. The Pharisee stood up, you remember, and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like the tax collector over there, him. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But that tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When Jesus hung on a cross, that's the guy who he's hanging on the cross for. You are the people who he's hanging on a cross for. Those who are genuinely feel cut off and yet can find it in themselves somehow to beg God. A distance can give us good perspective. And there is a long distance between now and the crucifixion. Bette Midler tried to put it into some sort of words, but all she was trying to say basically is God's watching you. He's watching you. He's watching what you're saying. 
He's watching what you're doing, so behave yourselves. But that's deism. That means that God's not involved in what we do. Deism basically teaches that God does exist. How many people have you come across who say God doesn't exist? Well, he does exist, believe me. He created the world, but he no longer gets involved in it. Humanity is on its own. You just have to get on with life without God's involvement. That's deism. That's what that song was talking about. But that's not the fact. The fact of the matter, according to what Jesus says in John's Gospel and various other places, is that he is concerned about you. He is concerned about what you think and what you do. He is concerned about your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. Not just with other Christians, but with the community at large. So how close is God to us? The resurrection was a day of great rejoicing in one respect, but of great sadness for the disciples. They looked to heaven and they saw Jesus disappear into the clouds. They didn't know where he was going. They hadn't a clue. They've just had a meal with him. What is going on? But he gave them another comforter, the Holy Spirit. He gave the comforter because he doesn't want us to be alone. He doesn't want us not to have him in our lives, in our existence, in our nations, in our world. And when you look around at trouble in the world, trouble in houses, trouble in societies, trouble in churches, you could basically go back to the fact that God's not there. He's been pushed to the side. That's not because God doesn't want to be there. That's not because Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life and the Holy Spirit doesn't want to interact with you. But it's because you and I have taken that decision. I hope you haven't, but that's what happens with humanity. So how, how close is God to you? How close do you feel him in those days of difficulty? Do you feel abandoned totally? Or do you feel as if there is a lifeline for you to get hold of? In Christ Jesus, there is life, life to the full, if we would but grasp it. Let's pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to read your scriptures in our own language. We thank you that you can help us to live our lives in accordance with your will and your purpose. And we pray that we might have joyful existences, that we might live lives that are pleasing to you, that you might change and transform us into the people you want us to be, and that we might be upholding you in all that we do, and that you would be pleased with our efforts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our last song, if we stand and sing, if you're able, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb.
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we ask that you go with us as we go our separate ways and help us to live lives worthy of you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.